Thank you. Um, I think this talk goes back to the question that Chris mentioned at, right at the beginning, how can SARE inform politics? Um, because that, for me, is the essential question at the moment. Uh, how can his work feed in to make a difference, put it simply? Um, he, as we know, he's, he's not that visible in academic uh, discussion about ecology. Uh, the tour is, the tour mentions Sayre a little bit, uh, but Sayre rarely appears in academic debate about climate change. Um, and he certainly doesn't, Sayre doesn't appear in popular conversations or debates. Um, people like Naomi Klein or uh, George Bombio over here, uh, you know, they, they don't mention philosophers generally, they certainly don't mention Sayre. So is it possible for Sayre to become, maybe jump over the academics, because he never liked academics, because um, they don't really make much difference in the end, or, uh, and can he go straight into the popular discourse? I'm trying to be optimistic, you see, in this, in this particular discussion. Um, and I, I think there are openings, but the, the paper will try and get there by looking at Ser and Gaia, which Latour, of course, has looked at quite a lot. Um, so here we go. In this paper, I argue that Latour's recent thoughts related to the theory of Gaia and Ser's idea of forming a natural contract open up distinctions, obviously, but also quite a lot of uh, productive connections. And this is despite Ser seemingly to dismiss Gaia, certainly in an interview, uh, because I think, as I said later, he misunderstood it. And in, in turn, Latour's pretty deep reservations about Sayre's natural contract. In Latour's promotion of Gaia in various articles, I mean, he, and you know, in The Guardian, he, he likes to promote himself quite a bit. He tends to concentrate on James Lovelock's writing uh, but in this paper, I want to show that it is Lovelock's collaboration with the microbiologist Lynn McGullis that helped to validate and refine the idea of Gaia, and that it is this partnership that brings the notion closer to some of Sayre's thought concerning the natural contract. As it happens, I mentioned this earlier, Sayre refers to uh, McGullis and uh, her book My Cosmos briefly in the opening of The Incandescent. It's really when he's looking at the uh, the grand narrative and the flows that he talks about uh, the grand narrative, and he mentions her, and he says, "I've lost my place there." Yeah, okay. Uh, her book explores history from the perspective of bacteria. Uh, the sole living inhabitants of life from about four billion years ago to the development of nucleated cells two billion years later. The reference to her work in The Incandescent helps to substantiate his descent into the grand narrative. And uh, he refers to the history of music going back uh, millions of years. And then he talks about bacteria and the bouquet of colors he observes that uh, Margolis describes, he says so agreeably. Yeah. And he says, it fills us in a way that's even more originally by going back towards a billion year old eras. And he says, she, he says of early bacteria, my vision drinks its fill of these colors like they do. And Margolis argues that the history of bacteria, quote, shows how all beings alive today are equally evolved, all survive from common bacterial ancestors. The most radical discovery involved mitochondria, tiny membrane inclusions in cells that at one time combined with bacteria, providing, quote, waste disposal and energy in return for food and water, end quote, but also a symbi symbiotic alliance 
that became permanent. Her description of these bodies that inhabit nearly every nucleated cell provides a fascinating narrative, I think, of the parasitic symbiotic relation that goes on in all living things. And with apologies to any scientists in the room, I'm just going to give you a very, very brief account of mitochondria. There are once bacteria that became symbiotically holed up inside larger bacterial cells. In a damp microbial mat, bacteria produce vast amounts of polluting oxygen, forcing everything around to evade or evolve. From this process, a type of oxygen breathing bacterium emerged, which was a fierce intruder. At first, these predators occupied hosts that were just barely kept alive. But when the hosts did die, they took the imposters with them. Eventually, only cooperators were left. The invaded victims and tamed mitochondria recovered from the attack and, as the story goes, have lived happily ever after for a billion years. So her account describes, I think, from a micro, uh, microbiological perspective, the development of a dynamically strong alliance through a range of parasitic operations. And it's interesting that her research into this, in her first paper, uh, was rejected 15 times by academic journals uh, and eventually became a, uh, a standard. So she was the parasite that became accepted. And I think my, my, uh, McGuinness's microbiology overlays says deliberations on the three interconnected forms of the parasite. Obviously, you've got the noise or interference in the background of all communications. You've got the biological activity that he explains in terms of the behavior of viruses, mainly, and the human relations as found in Tartuffe. A key point she makes in her research is that symbiosis is particularly convincing in explaining big jumps in evolution. For example, new partnerships between different species. Symbioses are like, she says, flashes of evolutionary lightning, end quote. And also, she says, sources of novelty. As we know in the parasite, Sarah wonders whether, quote, Evolution itself is not the work of parasites. And he says evolution has a parasitic structure. So there's a, there's some, some kind of links there. Her research re reveals a complex web of hostility, hospitality, or as Sayer describes the play Tartuffe, a story of detours and captures, where, quote from Sayer, the host becomes the guest of the guest. Pushing the correspondence perhaps a little bit further, mitochondria are something like perhaps Tartuffe himself, the included and the excluded third. In some, I think Margulis highlights how microbiology becomes ecology, tracing wider complex relations, partnerships, and negotiations. At the time, Australia at the same time, Margulis defines Gaia, to go back to Gaia, as a way of seeing the whole planet as symbiotic. Gaia, she says, quote, incessantly creates new environments and new organisms. Living things breathe through the seepage, waste or pollution of other life forms. Waste tests and stimulates new life. Now to turn to Lovelock, And as Latour says, uh, Gaia and Lovelock have been, he thinks, misinterpreted for many, many years. And he goes out his way, I think rather repetitively, to keep saying what mistakes have been made and it's not a totality. And it's, uh, he, he, see, he seems to want to defend it all the time, but he's certainly taken to it in many lectures, many um, articles. Gaia is the name of the game. And to turn to Lovelock, his book, Gaia, the Practical Science of Planetary Medicine, which was published in 1991, just a year after the natural contract, provides perhaps his most, I think, grounded and nuanced account of the theory. 
because it's been influenced a lot by my goddess. Gaia is in some sense alive, but not in the way that Sayre seems to have understood the theory from his brief remarks in uh, an interview. It is not an organism, as Sayre suggests. It is not like an animal or even bacteria. It is alive in terms of how temperature and chemical composition are attained in balance, suitable for the continuation of different life forms. Gaia, he says, is made up from all living things and their surface environment. The oceans, atmosphere, the crusted rocks, the two parts coupled together and indivisible, the inorganic and the uh, or organic. The invention of, of Gaia hypothesis, of course, for Latour, consists of granting agency to all living things. He urges us in particular to focus on the shallow surface layer of the earth, no more than a few kilometers thick, that has dramatically changed over recent centuries through human intervention, or maybe the golden spike since the 1950s, uh, the contested notion of the Anthropocene. In books uh, such as We Have Never Been Modern, and more so, or that's not mentioned so much, in An Inquiry into Modes of Existence, the Torah outlined experimental forms of represent representational democracy that included the interests of all living things, the Parliament of Things, and that's uh, in the former. But in more recent publications, he asks his readers more broadly to acquire a new sensibility. And he thinks that we need to acquire this before we can act politically. So Latour urges us to, quote, slip into, envelop ourselves within many loops so that gradually, step by step, knowledge of the place in which we live and the requirements of our atmospheric condition can gain greater pertinence and be experienced as urgent. As he says in Down to Earth Politics in the New Climatic Regime, the urgent political task is to generate alternative descriptions, a variety of alternative descriptions of what it means to inhabit the Earth. As well as the work of climate scientists, the Tor says these descriptions can, can come from novels, different forms of literature, scientific concepts, technical artifacts that expose multiple connections between agents that animate the Earth. And they all work across, he says, a sort of metamorphic zone. The Tor insists, like, say, I think, that this zone identified through diverse sources across the humanities and sciences is a property of the world itself. Gaia is an active, fragile, trembling, and easily irritated envelope. Now in his heavily revised Gifford lectures, Latour explicitly associates this way of relating to the earth with Sayre's comments uh, in the natural contract, the earth is now you know, responding. The Torah says that although Sayre does not name Gaia, Lovelock is naming the same reversal of the earth as subject and we as object. As Isabel Stengers urges, we must engage with the, quote, intrusion of Gaia. However, in his article, uh, this is the tour, Agency at the Time of the Anthropocene, which was published a year after the Gifford Lectures in Edinburgh, the tour was less appreciative of Sayre's natural contract. He called it, quote, a quaint idea and a stopgap measure arguing that the notion of a legal contract had lo lost its relevance because the crisis facing Gaia had become far worse, more urgent and violent. And although the heavily revised lectures that were published as a book offer a slightly more, well, actually quite a bit more considered reading of Sayre's text, what I find puzzling is how Latour overlooks the thought that Sayre has unfolded since the publication of the natural contract. After all, in branches, for example, Sayer writes that the whole book celebrates and renews the contract. And the tour completely seems to ignore Sayer's grand narrative, which I think endorses natural contract. I think the two 
can't they really be seen uh, separately? Now, of course, in the natural contract, Sayers asks, what language do the things of the world speak? And his answer, as we know, is that they speak in, uh, come the, they speak in a way that we might come to an understanding with them contractually. The earth speaks or responds in terms of forces, bonds, and interactions. And that is enough to make a contract. And as we know, he says that gravity is a, a very good example of that fundamental bond. As I have indicated, Margulis's research also offers a further layer of think of scientific evidence. She details an underlying commonality, the forces, bonds, and interactions of all life forms. But she also explains how bacteria spread and, quote, diversified and talk to each other on a global scale. Uh, bacteria have been chatting to each other for about three and a half billion years. What Louis Latour doesn't seem to fully recognize is that the contract certainly meets the urgency of our time of crisis because the contract has always existed. In Margulis's terms, how all beings alive today are equally evolved, all survive from common bacterial ancestors. And I think Chris's chapter on general ecology is particularly helpful on that point. To draw a law requires some form of language and the codes and forms of communication that humans share with the world offer a form of negotiation. But I was sort of quite pleased to find another way that Gaia, I think, draws towards Sayre's thought. As it happens, Lovelock, seemingly unnoticed by Latour, describes the symbiosis of microorganisms as, quote, a binding contract. He provides the example from Margulis's research into endosymbiosis and offers a less specialist illustration of a contract in the way bacteria in our mouth and gut act as a defense. Lovelock argues that contracts already determine and participate in our existence. And in what I think is a very significant statement says, quote, contracts articulate what it means to be part of or partner in a very democratic entity. Contracts articulate what it means to be part of or part in a very democratic entity. From such research, Lovelock goes on to argue that there is a precedent in nature for, quote, enduring contracts, and is so strong that as an intelligent species, we already have the map of the way ahead, end quote. Lovelock concludes that we now need to recognize, quote, contractual obligation, and on that basis, form a new partnership with the Earth. Lovelock says we are not masters of the Earth, and we cannot take charge of it but we have the intelligence and means to work as representatives of all living and non-living things. He says, quote, we must live with the earth as part of it by managing ourselves. We need to renew humanity and not the earth. The Lovelock's brief remarks are clearly minor compared with Sayre's deliberations on the legal necessity for a natural contract, but I think um, a fruitful alliance. As a footnote at this point, it's worth mentioning a mutual link uh, to the power of information technology. As we know, Sarah particularly welcome resources of the internet, new forms of mobile communication technology to connect people with each other and to share knowledge and expertise. But he also saw the power to connect and unite knowledge as a reflection of the bonds and contracts underlying the things of the world. From a Gaian perspective, Lovelock back in the late 1970s foresaw the climate emergency unfolding at, quote, an opportune time with the chance of a, quote, collective intelligence gained through information technology. The general point I wish to make is that it's important to show where connections with Sayre's thought emerge. This is a way for his ecological philosophy to become more visible rather than neglected as it generally is today. Differences are important, but commonalities are needed urgently, I think, if the scale and depth of the ecological crisis is to be addressed. Say is not alone in his call for a transformative ecology. The Tor likes to divide between enemies and friends, a political stance he openly takes from Carl Schmitt 
the German political theorist. I've tried to show common chords between Gaia and the idea of natural contract. The tour attempts to show how the theory of Gaia develops say thought. I hope to have indicated how say expands and deepens the notion of Gaia. In conclusion, and turning to present political questions, the fundamental shift required by ecological movements is, I think, and this is where I'm optimistic, gathering, although I expect it will be too late to avoid global violence and catastrophe, balanced. For example, we know Pope Francis in his 2016 far-sighted and informed encyclical says, a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. The way we treat each other cannot be separated from the exploitation of the earth. The question I open is this, is says we're able to help students, scientists, climate activists, religious leaders, indigenous groups, journalists, lawyers, and citizens generally to change the narrative from the production, sorry, from the protection and conservation of nature to something more transformative. I think Mark Gullis puts it particularly well. She says this, to me, the human move to take responsibility for the living earth is laughable, the rhetoric of the powerless. The planet takes care of us, not we of it. Our self-inflated moral imperative to guide a wayward earth or heal the sick planet is evidence of our immense capacity for self-delusion. Rather, we need to protect us from ourselves. As Sarah says, we need to bring about peace between ourselves to safeguard the world and peace with the world to save ourselves. We need what he calls single virtue to steer ethics and politics that encompass the earth and humanity. A legal contract of symbiosis as evoked by Lovelock and Margulis and retold by Sarah as a possible source of evolutionary novelty. Thank you. Very much, very much. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, just on the the Latour the thing, uh, yeah. I I have a sort of a suspicion that sort of will stop reading, sir. Uh, right, could well be. You know, and so a lot. Yeah. Didn't, didn't pass it by, yeah, yeah. Just in terms of the, the sort of the role of the contract in, in Latour's thinking and why it may or may not engage with that, it's sort of helpful to look at some of Latour's earlier stuff where, where fundamentally the problem he's wrestling with is, is a politics of explanation. Mm -hmm. He's in a sort of philosophy of science type problem of why, how do we explain why one technology takes off or, or how do we explain scientific discovery? And it's all judging between rival human accounts, and then you know which are you know given that they have equivalent access to resources doesn't mm -hmm. get us very far. So the turn in that actor network theory stuff is to say we're just missing a whole bunch of stuff in our explanation. It's the participation of you know, the world itself in the production mm -hmm. of scientificity that's kind of missing, and, it, and that's almost the moment where a notion of contract could be useful mm -hmm. around the kind of mm -hmm. politics of explanation. Mm. But that then very rapidly becomes this sort of generalized theory of actants and a generalized mm. kind of politics of, of things. So almost the direction of travel means that the point where contracts could have been useful has already been sort of surpassed in that thing. You know, so it goes in this like different mm. direction mm. of travel. Mm. Um, I think it's in sort of notions of substitution and translation from Sarah that really then yeah. become super helpful in practice mm. or something think from the the mid 90s you know that you mm. it's it's so it's almost like that there was a little kind of moment for Tom Price that, that didn't sort of end up in the explanation mm. mm. yeah yeah I, I mean I, I agree I mean yeah I suppose it has just stopped reading so um that's okay but uh then I don't think he should be critical uh, without knowing that you know Sarah was still alive and he was actually writing those sorts of books that were all all but a lot of them were about uh, the ecological crisis and I mean I find that I mean those like the um parliament of things I, I think they were just experiments I think they were useful but I think he Latour said himself 
they, you know, uh, I'm just playing around with their ideas and, uh, and, he, and he didn't go back to them. And he hasn't talked in that way of a sort of constitutional uh, representative forum for some time. And it's more now this uh, thing I would say about inviting his reader to find ways of becoming close to the earth. But in a way, it's a bit closer to Sarah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're interesting contrasts. I mean, the contrast I like is, is how Sarah is so naive, naively, perhaps, optimistic about the current contemporary era and the technology we have and the internet and everything. Whereas the Torah is the exact opposite. Um, you know, he says, we couldn't be living in the worst possible time to cope with something like the, the ecological crisis, you know, because it's, it's just cliches. Everyone's always on their phone and all that sort of thing. But you, don't, you know, they're, they're very contrasting uh, views and the Torah's, um, very pessimistic about the choices. Yep. Thank you, Lisa. I think these are really important contemporary tropes, actually. Mm -hmm. I think um, I've been working through the soon to be published Love Lot Margulis Correspondence. That would yeah. be a really great resource for you to look at from yeah. September. And there's lots to say, but one interesting thing, and this is fun, and you can run with this or not, is to index the use of Gaia with the biographical data. And it's very interesting what begins to come out. And I'm going to suggest that Gaia can be this empty shell on which to project, project a pre-formatted politics. So uh, Lovelock in his early life came from a Quaker family. His father was a trade unionist. His initial uh, understanding of what application of Gaia was a, what he called a trade unionism of the biota, <laughs> that you get in there and you negotiate to ensure the homeostatic regulation of the planet continues. Mm -hmm. In his later life, when he became a curmudgeon, he still is conservative. Um, he now understands Gaia in a highly dirigistic way, that we're there to take lordship and to manage the homeostatic conditions that are there um, via super intelligence. Algulis came from a Jewish Zionist family. Mm -hmm. Her ethic was one of accommodation uh, and uh, Latour from, is a French Catholic who has uh, excerpts from Laudato Si and Sitcock on the wall of his study. He comes out of a French mystical tradition with Charles Peggy as his hero. His understanding of Gaia is Catholic, it's mm. about unicity being. So it's really interesting for the map I think for me personally, Gaia is likely to be the kind of key tool for the 21st century, thinking about whole swathe of disciplinary themes, but it can be very readily co-opted to one's personal mm, uh, well. It has, of course, been co-opted in all sorts of ways. But I mean, my idea is it, yeah, it, I went into Waterstones here in Cambridge because where I live, we don't have big bookshops and things like that. And um, uh, Jones and Shelves of books on the climate crisis, as you see. Um, but there was Lovelock there, and I saw his early, early books. So he has a sort of popular appeal, or Gaia has a popular appeal. It's very open to misinterpretation. But if it's uh, seen through Mergosi's eyes more, in a more sort of subtle way, and we can bring Sarah in, then he can sort of piggyback the parasite, as it were. Uh, and as long as we don't water down Sarah, and as long as it's Sarah bringing stuff rather than, you know, maybe that's one, one way that Sarah could gain a bit more visibility. I don't yeah, know. and just at the moment in, um... Rochester Cathedral in the south of the UK, mm. there is a huge, huge um, 
installation of planet Earth simply called Gaia, sure. and the sermons being delivered by the bishop yeah. apparently underneath this installation. Um, at Greenbelt this summer, which is a Christian festival, the thematic there is Gaia, and it's yeah. going off in so many directions. It's yeah. quite extraordinary. And yeah. if you look at the word on the Guardian, you find something different than if you look it up on conservative home. So it really is this empty signifier yeah. at the moment, yeah. I would suggest. And uh, just to be aware of the way it's going to be yeah. filled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we need to fill it maybe with uh, I don't know. <laughs> naive, naive. Bruce Clark's work is where is the is really important mm. here. So that'd be worth looking at as well. Mm. I've got something just on something that you you almost said in passing in the pit, but I, I wanted to go back to uh, I think it was Latour who said we we must have a new sensibility before we can act politically. And mm. I just wanted to question the necessity of, of a sequence there. Mm. Um, I, I, I was thinking of that Pascalian Ponce where he says, um, kneel down and say your prayers and then you will believe. And that people have scorned that quotation often, you know, you're forcing yourself, you're fooling yourself. Um, and, and Zizek has some wonderful things to say about it. But, but I, I think what he's saying is that, that that you can't separate off what you think about the world from the way that you act in it. You can't expect to act one way and, and believe a, a, a whole different set of set of facts about the world. That, that there will necessarily be a, a correspondence between them. And so you, you must your behavior must be in line with, with what you're what you believe, but otherwise you won't believe it. Mm. Um, and and couldn't we push back on on Lato in a similar way and say, no, 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 you don't need a new sensibility before you act politically. You need to act politically in order to cultivate and and, and bring on the, the new sensibility. If you wait <laughs> until it's there, until this sensibility is beautifully formed and you see the world in a whole new rich way. Before you lift a finger <laughs> to act, you're never going to act. Mm. Yes, yeah. it's, it's true. Um, yeah, and of course, I mean that sort of debate goes on, I think, quite a bit in the, with the climate activists when you've got some climate activists are just thinking about oil and uh you know stop oil blah blah or veganism is the answer or this that and the other and if you introduce bigger questions like uh i think indira indira gandhi said uh, you know, poverty is pollution it's not it's not just <laughs> oil and the fossil fuels and um but then they say no you, you're, you're distracting, you know, you're, you're uh, taking away from the, the main issue and therefore it's going to take longer to uh, to get there. But I think, unlike Latour, I think Sarah is ahead of the game, as it were, if, 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 with the grand narrative, which I haven't talked about, and the natural contract put together, there is a way of um, looking at things very fundamentally differently and transformatively. It's utopian, but we need utopia at the moment because we're fast going uh, in the wrong direction. Could you just briefly indicate how you make the connection with the natural contract and the chronopedia? How I link the two? Um, well, give us some guesswork. I'm sorry? Give us some guesswork. On <laughs> <laughs> um, because I mean, the, the the grand narrative shows all the commonalities between everything. Yeah, all the bonds, all the interactions that have been from this you know, billions of years, uh, and that it, it brings us to the present. But in understanding that grand narrative, he wants you to do, you know, the, that syllabus that for uh, universities, you know, it's that sort of thinking 
that uh, leads you to see the contract as something that includes everything. Yeah, the world and ourselves, and that we're not separate. We've got five minutes left in this session. Can I throw open a general point of discussion, which is where I think we're going as a group, and I want to see what people, how people react to it. So I was struck by what um, Stephen Connor said in, in the first presentation, which is that there's no says in politics. And I was like, okay, well, pack my bag and go home then. Um, but but what, what seems to be coming out to me is, is that Sir is, is, is politically potent in, in, insofar as he either parasitizes the thought of, of someone else, another position, or, or as he is parasitized. But it seems to me that what's been said so far, perhaps, is that there's no pure Sersian policy, but there's, there's a lot of political heft in his work when it's brought into conversation with others. Now, I'm not saying that's my opinion, I'm saying that's what I think has been said so far, and I just want to see what other people think about that, David. Uh, yeah, I take your point, I'll just add uh, what I think would be a kind of take sort of addition to that, which will be one of the other things that, um, that Stephen kind of talked about this morning was that Sarah is a um, phenomenologist of phenomenologist of philosophy is the phrase. Yeah. Yeah. Which did one was Yeah. Um, I, I see you get that. I mean I think there's a lot of sources. Yeah, but it, 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 the connection with what you're saying is that um Gives us a way of thinking with Corpus and against Corpus and so And actually, those ways of are, um, you might be described in terms of parasitism. Um, so, you, you can take ways of thinking that come from others and uh, detract from him, perhaps. Uh, and the, one of the reasons why he's not himself a political philosopher is because he's not pragmatic, which is what really gets me. Not saying he is the answer, but. He seems to be very good at giving us ways to uh, take that shift by the way just uh, agreeing with you. That uh, might be interesting. And anyone else on that? Yeah. yeah, there was this. I don't remember which lecture it is, but there's one lecture online by Sir where he makes this. Um, I find it extremely I mean, one can say it's uh, it's it's schematic and, and abstract, but he makes I find a very very important distinction between between um, steering and leading. Mm -hmm. You know, so 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 steering process it is with is with uh, economical governance, is with managing, but leading is having an idea where this whole thing should go, where it comes from, and how to get there. Mm -hmm. And to have such an idea demands an abstract point of view. It demands a, 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 a relation to a kind of a verticality, which is mm -hmm. not processual and cybernetically proceduralized on all the points, mm -hmm. which is the key for pragmatism to be effective. Mm -hmm. And this distinction, I find, it, I find it very, very, very important, and we are losing it. So we, 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 I mean, what we call politics today is government is managing problems, mm -hmm. which means creating stocks of ownerships, yeah, and so on. Did you want to No, no, I think that was just a very thought provoking point. Um, okay. I did. Yeah. Did I see a hand? And we could maybe kind of, we could maybe differentiate as well between partisan politics, it's a banal point, and the political with a small p. Mm -hmm an ontology of actants, the way they bump up and negotiate with one another that's taken forward in political theory by Hondal Mouffe and others, and then that is exactly the nature of politics taken up by Miller Tour. So sometimes we can slip from one to the other, um, because I would suggest there's right down there in the small p domain. Any, any final words on this before we close the session? I mean, just say that he does talk to it occasionally about the need for a new politics. Um, you never, you never quite.
goes any further than that. But um, yeah, that's what we need is a new politics with a small p. Yeah. On that note, <laughs> thank you, Peter. Thank you.